So, how's it going, man? You good? Yeah, I'm cool, mate. How are you? Yeah, man, I'm all right. Um, so, basically, like, just to get this all started, just give, like, give us a little bit of background about yourself and how you got into this sort of music and that. Um, I guess, like, like, many, many, many years ago, I made, um, I used to make a lot of grime music. I had a few tunes, but, like, nothing big or anything. So, I always, like, always liked the production side of things. Um, always played a lot of instruments and stuff in school and all of that. So it sort of just came naturally to me. Um, and then I guess that was dubstep. I met, um, I met, who was it? Who did I meet first? I think I met, you know, Seven. I met him first, um, just going to shows or whatever. And then I met Youngster through him. And then, yeah, like just sort of from there, just became mates with Youngster and just started doing loads of stuff with him. Did a lot of artwork stuff um, for Century. And then just started sending him tunes here and there. And then, yeah, it all sort of just came stem from that. Cool. Uh, well, so we, you're like a graphic designer by trade, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm a UI designer. That's my sort of day-to-day job. Which I okay, guess is cool. a designer in a way. Yeah, yeah. That's sick. Um, like, where are you based? Like, you know, like, just to give people a bit yeah. of like... I live in London in a place called Harrow. That's uh, where I grew up. It's all right area, pretty standard sort of London area. Some shit areas within it, some nice areas within it. Um, That's yeah. London, isn't it? Yeah. Sort of grew up, grew up listening to a lot of like rock music um, and hip hop. Um, and then obviously like grime came around when I was probably in high school. Um, I think I remember like when I was in year eight, that's when So Solid Crew 21 Seconds dropped. Um, yeah. I, I think, yeah, from there sort of the grime sound came out and I think... By the time I sort of left school, I was quite into the grime sound. Um, used to listen to a lot of people like, I guess like Low Deep, um, Terror Danger, uh, Da Vinci, sort of that sort of era. So like 2007, 2006 sort of time. And then, yeah, yeah, yeah. making grime based around that. And it was, yeah, it was really, it was good fun. Um, I sort of had a more of a careless mind back then. But now I'm too yeah. sort of, well, there isn't too much, but right now I'm proper like into the whole mix down bollocks and all that. But before then, I guess like when I listened to my tunes back then, I could sort of hear how I didn't really care about any of that. And I guess it sort of came out of the music where it was a bit more, a bit more free. Raw. Yeah, yeah. Is that lighting there? Yeah. Yeah, like, um, yeah it all works for good, good on my end. Um, so, just... Um, so I've been getting questions from people from like my Discord server and like you know uh, people on Instagram and that, and they, um, a lot of them were asking like how, like how you sort of came about like getting your first release on like one of the biggest labels, like because obviously you were friends with like Youngster and that, but and like, he was the A and R guy for Temper, I believe. Yeah, um, it was quite random to be honest. I mean, if I had it my way, I probably wouldn't have released on Temper as my first release. I think. Um, yeah, like, you know, it's good It's good to have that accolade and all that. But I think, you know, I probably would have enjoyed going through the struggles that I go through now when I started. Um, so the way that release came around is, I think, I think I was, like, I was friends with him for about, I don't know, three years or so before we even knew I made tunes. So we were just mm. chatting, getting pissed together or whatever. Um, and then I started selling him stuff. I guess he, like, he heard that there was some sort of potential there. So I think... We jumped in the studio a couple of times. I think we made that release. We made it at Rinse FM on one speaker. <laughs> it's quite funny. <laughs> yeah, like I just it, it just came around, just like being mates. And then obviously, I think, yeah, we just started faffing around making tunes together. And I think we just made a few ideas. And then he was like, right, let's do something with them. So I think he pitched them, him being the mm-hmm. A&R guy, pitched them to um, his sister. And they were like, yeah, like we like the release. I think in hindsight, I probably would have flipped the release around. I would have had the A side, the B side as the A side, and the A side as the B side. But that's always yeah. the way. I think it just came it came about by just sort of going to shows and getting to know people and just talking to people. And I think you know, opportunities arise anywhere. Um, yeah. I think, you know, making yourself known to people um, and showing them what you're about, I think you know, helps a lot. I think yeah, like, I think I've probably been quite privileged having him and certain other people sort of backing me quite a lot um which is why i sort of try if i find someone or hear someone that you know i like their tune i'll try and play it as much as i can or 
you know, do whatever it takes. Because I feel like the struggle for me to get to where I am now was probably slightly easier than other people feel purely because of who you know. Um, then that's not to say the music shit or whatever, but I think, you know, releasing on 10 for the first time is quite a, quite a big thing. But I don't know, man. I sort of feel like I could have done a few smaller labels and worked the grind, but the, that's what it is. Yeah, definitely. I think, like, regardless of, like, what you're doing in, in music anyways, it's, you know, I'd say 70% of it is who you know. Um, yeah, like, I, I think that's for most people because like everyone needs a foot in the door. You're not gonna um, you're not gonna get a release on a on a decent sized label without someone who knows someone who can put your stuff in front of them because it's so difficult to find someone or just stumble across someone and it happens every now and again. But you need to increase your chances by just knowing people in definitely. general. I think you know like some there's some people out there that are just they're just really good as well. So that's how they get yeah. Well, they just got the they got the ear for it, you know. So. But yeah, that's sort of how that came around. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, I wouldn't change it, but I, th- I did feel like when I released on Tempo, it was like always it was a label I always wanted to release on. And yeah, my first release mm. on Tempo I felt a bit like, oh, well, now what sort of thing? But then I realised it wasn't really about the label. After that, it was more yeah. about how do I better myself as a producer, um, and that's all I really focus on now. Yeah, I, I had the exact same thing when I released the Duck Block because I've been list- like that's. Following their channel was how I sort of discovered um, 140 and stuff. And then when I got my release with them, that, that was my first release ever. And I was just like, Jesus, okay, sick. <laughs> and then it was just like, where to go from from there, like you just said. And it's um, you hit the nail on the head with that. It's like, it is about bettering yourself as an artist and also, you know, sort of keeping people stuck around to listen to what you're doing as well. Because, you know, you can, you've can you always got to try and better yourself. and. Uh, that's the only way that people are going to stick around and listen to your shit like definitely man so, I think the, most, the most important thing that I think of is like you're only in competition with yourself and that's it it's like does it yeah. if you if you can disconnect from everyone else and what everyone else thinks you probably find that you're more free because I think like you know I've every, every producer has got into like a, a place where they hear a tune that someone else has made and they want to try and replicate the success and sound of it but you find that that when that tune was made, that that person probably didn't even think anything of it. Like that, you know, the bit I, I probably put a lot of money on it that a lot of the big tunes that people have made are the ones where they've gone in and just fucked about and it just came out of nowhere. I don't think anyone sits yeah. there making a big tune. So I think like an important part of it is sort of just adhering to what you truly think something should be. And it might not hit home with people to start with, but sooner or later, you know, the more of a unique sound you can have, um, the, the more unique your sound would be. And I think every person is quite a unique individual. So it's like, how can you bring that into your music? I think mm. someone who does that really well, um, probably like Headland, I think, you know, I'm quite a good mate. Yeah. His attitude is generally like, fuck it, I don't care what anyone thinks, I'm just going to do my thing. And you know, obviously he's like killing it. And yeah, like it's quite inspiring, you know, to have someone like that around where they're just like, fuck it, man, just do whatever you want, mate people like it they like it if they don't they don't it doesn't really matter yeah i always tell like people that are listening to like my channel and things like you know people i get the question sometimes like how do you get like your unique sound or like you know how do you go about developing a sound and it's like just play into your tastes because like whatever you like listening to in music you just gotta pursue that and keep going with it because um if you like it someone else probably will exactly man i think that's where I sort of got into using a lot of hardware because a lot of the hardware I have has like a unique and strange sound. So it was like, mm. yeah, we're all making 140. There's only so many mathematical ways you can make a drum beat in 140. But how can you make yeah. the tech sound a bit different? I think for me, like I think when I made my album, I think I was still discovering that sound and how to push it more, how to get better mix downs. I think the next release I've got coming now is like a lot more refined, I find. But um that's purely because you know like you're making 12 tracks you know you've got a timeline and i just mm. thought again i just thought fuck it man like when i listen to it now i'm like fuck it i could have done this better could have put more effort in could have made the mix down better then i'm like fuck it you made an album it's done it's in the past how can you make the next thing better and i think that's what yeah. the most important bit of advice i would give anyone that people have given me is like always just remain in competition with yourself man and your persistence and your you know, your progress, if you sit there every day and try and make one idea, even if it's a 16 bar, 
every single day, like within a year, your 16 bar ideas are going to be pretty good because you understand all the bits of the jigsaw connect together in your mind a bit more. Yeah. No, definitely. I, I agree with that. Um, yeah. Like, like talking about um, albums and that, like you're one of the few people, I'd say maybe like Bengal Sound's another one, where you're almost exclusively like focusing on albums now, aren't you? Like there's, it's not so much EPs. Nah, like I think, nah, not me. I mean, for me, it's more... Okay. Yeah, I mean, I did, I did that album just because I was like, you know what, I always, since I was young, I, was like, I always wanted to write an album in it. Um, so I just did it based upon that. Like, I want to write it. Okay. I, I gave myself, I think, seven months to do it. Um, and yeah, just got on with it. I think, for me, it's more of a... The focus isn't necessarily the album. It's more of like, not to sound all cliche and shit, but it's more of mm. what is the concept of something you're doing. So I think like my next release, which is coming on Century, um, I'm not sure of the date, it's pretty soon. But that was mm. more, around, okay, how can you do the absolute opposite of what that album was? And that's basically what I tried to do. So, you know, it's more like the track, there's four tracks are there. You know, one of them is very like mid, like quite aggressive sounding, which is like the title track. And another one's very hip hop orientated, so it's sampling, you know, using old techniques. Like I used, used this when I was doing it, S1000, just to get that really 16 bit shitty sound. And then the other nice. one's just be, uh, sort of, I guess sort of like the system, uh, deep medi sort of inner mind sort of deep sound. And then the last track mm -hmm. is just reggae dub, because I'm obsessed with reggae dub, obsessed. Yeah. I literally keep a bass guitar next to me at all times in the studio <laughs> just so I can write shit on it and then translate it to this. But That's um, sick. For me, it's more of like, what's the concept? So the concept for this one is called, um, the release is called Endo, so the EP, it's Endo EP. But it's just all about just when I've been blazed out of my mind, what sort of music would I like? <laughs> yeah, basically what it was. It's just the concept yeah, yeah. around marijuana, but I do not smoke marijuana. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, same here, man. Like, uh, I think it helps like so many people, and it's it's it is a like one of those like wonder substances that the world's like given to like you know it's one of the craziest substances to like ever come out of the earth naturally and that. But you know, for me, doesn't doesn't work. <laughs> it's it's not for me. But I think going back yeah. to Ben Pound, I, he, I would say he's another one who just does his thing. Like he doesn't. You can hear in his music, he's not adhering to any parameters. He's not going, right, I want to be, I want my tune to sound like Komodo. Da, 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 da. He's just going, right, I'm going to, I mean, I assume he's, he's a Bengal person or Asian. Mm. He puts Asian samples into his thing. So he must have grown up with all that. That's how he knows all those six samples. So he's just like, right, mm. I like Brian, I like dubstep. I'm going to take that Asian influence that I have, put it in my music however I see fit. And like, when I listen to his tunes, like his way of sampling is, is so different from everyone else's because it's like, he's not just going 16 bar loop, put drums in it. He's going take, it's like, it's almost like, he sort of does it the Todd Edwards way where he'll get loads of different mm. bits of track and then build a track with it rather than taking loops and adding stuff on top of it. But again, you can hear in his sound, it's, it's a free sound. You know, there's no- it, For me, his, his music really reminds me of like um, Flying Lotus's style of like, um, <laughs> Yeah, and it's it's just it sounds super authentic, and you know he's probably one of my favorite producers making our sort of music at the minute. He's super talented. You know, the killer is about him. Um, like, he hasn't even hit his peak yet. When he does, we're all gonna be fucked. no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in it, man. Like when he released his culture, I've I've literally. I, I don't know. Like, I pre-ordered the um. Oh, yeah. The <laughs> little tape thing, and like I listened to that on a little cassette cassette thing that I bought on eBay, and I was just like, shit. <laughs> like it's What's just nuts and about the tape thing i bet that... i put my money on it that he was like i'm gonna put my tracks in tapes i bet he heard a lot of the indian tunes just like my parents had on like cassette tapes that's all it was when i was young yeah, man. Like, it's sick to see someone throw back to that and do it so well it's nice i i reckon like because when i listen to his samples um and stuff they've, it's it's got that like you know grainy tape like sort of feel to it so i reckon he's like sampling tape a lot like yeah a lot of people will sample vinyl because of their like hip hop heads and stuff. I bet he's got his like parents like cassette collection. And he's just like ripping all that. Like, and it's good. It's good to see like some something different. You know, I like that. Yeah, definitely. Um, 
So how have you been dealing with like lockdown and everything? Because it's, it's pretty, pretty nuts, you know? You know what? I've been all right. Um, I mean, personally, I'm living with my, I live with my girlfriend, so she's, she's really chilled and nice and keeps me grounded. Does a lot for me. <laughs> so, um, hmm. yeah, I think our, my living situation is quite nice. So it's like we're just living together in our flat and chilling. Um, but yeah, like I, think I, find, I think the thing I find hard is like the lack of going to dances and getting that inspiration. But I think when I've been making tunes, I feel like what I did was during this lockdown, I just completely clocked what my workflow should be. So based upon that, I've managed to make quite a few good tunes or ideas or whatever. And I think like, for me, it's just all about the workflow. So I spent in the lockdown, I just spent the downtime of right, you know, the, the no pressure time as I like to call it, where you've got to try and yeah. get booked got to try and get released and I was like fuck it I'm just gonna figure out what, what, what the workflow should be and just nail it and then just try and make as many ideas as I can and that's when I sort of I guess switched to Bitwig and that's where sort of everything came from there um but mentally yeah I've had ups and downs you know I imagine a lot of people have moments not being able to see their friends and family but I guess like it's for the greater good isn't it I think that's the thing that keeps me going that whatever we're doing with the isolation and lockdown is it's for the greater good of everyone and I think that's what keeps me going. But yeah, I think I've been doing okay with it. The first few weeks I was boozing like a lunatic, but I've stopped all that now. Mm. Yeah, yeah it's, same it's, here, man. <laughs> yeah. I was actually 10 that's... bricks of just fucking drink them in a week and shit. It was bad. Yeah, man. Like, <laughs> I, I just got rid of all my bottles just because of the video, but like that little corner like back here was just like filled to the door pretty much. <laughs> it's <was> pretty bad. <laughs> but... <laughs> yeah. um. Yeah, man. Like, uh, I've just come out like the the other end of um of like some weird like stunt where I just stopped interacting with people for like two weeks and I stopped uploading YouTube videos and stuff like that. Like, it's weird how like your mind plays tricks on you when you're alone, and like um yeah, it's it's just the most surreal experience. This whole like lockdown thing. Because I, I, at first I was handling it like crazy well and being super productive. Like, yeah, let's get get it done. You know, set, set up this YouTube channel and get going and write loads of music and then burn out hard <laughs> so being it alone, happens being alone is probably a lot harder than sort of having living with someone so i can definitely appreciate yeah. that it's quite difficult at times um so and um you were talking about workflow so a lot of people that are sort of starting out in music and things um you know, I'd say like for the first like year or so, or maybe two years, they're sort of just like figuring out how to use use their um, DAW and stuff. What would you say has been like a massive help for you, even if it's just like basic stuff of just like figuring out basics of, of working around um, developing your workflow and things like that? Um, I think for me personally, it was how can I how can I get the hardware that I use and make tunes with it as fast as possible. So the way that I try and work, and this is like the way that I do it, um, which might help some people, it takes a bit of practice to be able to do it, like a good few, like a good couple years, a year of like assistance. But I actually taught this theory to um, like Zed Bias and Mr. K does it as well, and a few other people. So basically it's just, it's, a, it's called time boxing, so it's not like a new thing. But what I do, I go, right, mm. I open my project, which has my template, everything ready, everything plugged in, ready to go. And I go, in 30 minutes, I'll set a timer. I'm going to make a drum beat, just a 16-bar loop, not 32, not 8, 16, because I find that's a good amount. I'm going to make a drum beat, and I'm, I'm going to make a bass line, and I've only got half an hour to do it. And the way that I can do it so quickly is, I mean, everyone's got fucking gigabytes of samples on their computer, like you can never have enough. But I think I had to purge all my samples. I've still got them on here. I went through all my old tunes, all my old projects, and I go, right, which tunes did I make or which ideas did I make where I like the kick drum? I open those projects, find out all those kick drums, put all those kick drums in a folder, and I said, right, I'm only going to have 40 kick drums, did the same thing with snares, did the same thing with hi-hats. So if you see here, I don't know if you can see that. you see it? Right. Yeah, yeah. And it's just so. a MIDI controller, um, and the top row is linked to sample selection for kick. So it's kick, snare, clap, hi-hat, rim, all that shit. Um, so what cool. I do, I'll just flip the knobs on that randomly and just end up with a drum kit, um, which has 14 snares, 14, uh, 40 hats. And I know every single one of them sound good. So I went in, I processed all of them. 
I didn't necessarily EQ the shit out of all of them because some of them might have a low end that I want on it and another idea. Some of them might not, you know what I mean? So I kept that nice. Mm-hmm. I just process them, make sure they're all the same sound. Just had a sample pack that I just kept to. And like every two, three months, I'll update it with something new. So I guess workflow-wise, just pick, pick your sounds and stick with them. There's no like magical, like, I guess like with musical samples or things like that, that's always going to be something you have to hunt for. But for drums yeah. and all that stuff, like for sub bass, all that stuff, like just stick to the samples that you know sound good and just use them and process them in different ways over and over and you'll just end up with something. But just stick with like a sample pack that is yours. And then that's an all, an, another way to sort of keep, get a sort of a unique sound is that that sample, pack's, that sample pack is going to be sounds that you've selected that are to mm-hmm. your take mentioned. So that would be the first thing I'd say. So first half an hour, do drums and bass. Second half an hour, make a hook. Third half an hour, maybe do percussion. And in the fourth half an hour, do the fastest fucking arrangement you could possibly do. So like intro. Uh, I mean, the way I work is I'll do like an intro, then I'll do 16, then I'll try and do a middle eight, then I'll do a breakdown, then another 16 second drop, all that stuff. But I'll literally just copy and paste the whole project out of all these loops that I've made in that time. And then lo and behold, it feels like I've got something closer to a finished tune than just the looped idea even though I haven't gone in and done all the edits and all the, you know, the intricate bits of arrangement, I feel like that there mm. is a short of a tune there. And I've sort of achieved that in like, I think like three hours is what I saw. Three hours of six half an hour blocks, I think works well for me, mm. the idea creation. And if at the end of it, I'm like, I'm vibing to it. I'm like, yeah, sick. Because the reason that I feel this approach works is because you're sort of, because of the time limit, you're forcing yourself to fucking, to make a decision quickly. You're not sitting yeah. there going, is this kick right? Is this kick right? Is this kick correct? Oh, the fundamental on this one. Oh, is this one too tough? You're just like, I know this kick works, bang. I know this snare works, bang. And just get it done. Because you'll find most of the time, just with a little bit of EQ and whatever, you can get it to sound okay and good enough. Um, and also, because you've made it really quickly and you haven't spent hours on it, you're not like emotionally attached to it either. So you can say, mm. oh, I should have probably changed that snare because it's not going to work. You know, I should probably do this, do that, the other. So... I think, yeah, workflow-wise is have your, number one is have your own sample pack. Try and make ideas as fast as you can if you can work fast. If you can't work fast, then try and figure out a way to sort of speed up your decision-making. I think the most important one is have fun. Like, have a workflow that's fun. Like, if you use hardware or you like using MIDI controllers, like, try and use them as much as possible. You know, get tactile with things and you'll find that by using you know, MIDI controllers and doing automation that way, you get all those little nuances that you can't really get with a keyboard and mouse. They would be the three things yeah. I'd say. That's I Decent, man. Yes. Some really good info in that. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, oh, yeah. So uh, you, you used Ableton before and you've got Bitwig now and they're both, um, I think, what I've coined online is like, dual sequencer doors. So they have like a, uh, a window like where it, you can arrange things in a window where you can sort of just like throw ideas up. Um, you're a big proponent of like the session view or like the, you know, um, using the little boxes, like the live, live performance bit, uh, right? I think, so I'd say post album, so from the beginning of this year, mm-hmm. I would say I sort of did a transfer mm-hmm. where I sort of started as, I was stuck in Ableton. I'll, I did never use that session view stuff ever. I thought it was fucking weird. I was like, what's this bollocks? Move straight to arrangement. Then I started realizing, okay, working in loops is quite cool. So I just used to just create 16 bars inside the arrangement view. And then mm. I must have, I think I went, I went to Silky's house once and he was like showing me Bitwig. So this was like right when I finished my album, sort of around, I guess, Christmas time around then. I went to his house and he was showing me Bitwig. I was like, fucking hell, this is sick. And I was thinking of getting a new Mac. And he was like, nah, bruv, get a PC, man. Fuck Macs. PCs are better, like more power, less money. Blah, blah, blah. So I literally just switched from mm. Mac, from Ableton, to a PC, to Bitwig. Because I was convinced that it doesn't matter what tool you use to make music. You can do it on anything. You know, like there's no, like I guess like some stock plugins are going to be better than others in certain DAWs. But, you know, you can just fucking make anything on anything. Like Burial made his whole first album on True on a, that Sony Acid, which yeah, you know, like it doesn't matter. So I was like, I'm just gonna take the plunge. So I played with Bitwig a little bit. 
And I was like, yeah, it has similar, it works in a similar way to Ableton. I think I believe that the developers that first came up with the concept of Ableton are the ones that made Bitwig as well. So that's why it has similarities. I was like, fuck yeah. it. So <laughs> by the time I left his house, I already decided, right, buying a PC, we went hard on Bitwig, and I've just been using it since. I think he came over a few times, or I went to his or whatever, and then he started showing me the session view. And he was the one who showed me how fast it was to sort of make a tune out of the session view using the different scenes. And I think the reason I like it now is I'm not, when I'm, I've got like two phases of my workflow. Phase one is be creative and just make ideas. Phase two is a mixing down part. I'll try and mix down as I go along, but I generally just use filters. Like I won't do any mad repair work or anything like that, like taking out peaks or anything. I'll just do like cut mm. the load on top sort of stuff. But the thing that, it's really good about session view is I was just creating ideas. I weren't going, oh, I'm going to make a tune. I was going, I'm just going to make some cool ideas. And I'll just sit here, I'll just, with all the hardware I have or just stuff synths and shit on the computer, I'll just stack melodies, stack drum beats, copy and paste that drum beat, change it and just stack it. And I was like, right, this is really good. It's working really well. How can I make it so I feel like I'm playing, you know, playing music? And that's when I got one of these bad boys, which is this. So, so now, I'll literally just create all my loops. So let me see if I open something. I know I'll share the screen after, but you would see it on here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so like you just end up with this. So, you know, each row, um, sorry. Yeah, so each, each row is just a series of patterns that I've made. Um, and mm -hmm. I can just execute each pattern. But the thing that was good about it, I'll just press record. I'd know what each pattern was, and it felt like I was playing my tune. And again, mm. like rather than going 16 intro, drop, take out the bass, add another thing, 16 breakdown, second drop, I was going, fuck it, I'm just going to do whatever feels right with the loops. Stop them, start them, and record. And then I found out, wow, this has literally speed up, this sped up the whole process of making a tune so fast. So I'm not thinking about making a tune, I'm thinking about creating ideas and being creative. And combining them. Yeah, and combining them together rather than pressurizing myself like I have to finish this tune so people play it I'm like, I don't care about that I'm just like I just got to make ideas that I like and as soon as I did that mm. like playing with the hardware more and opening my mind a bit I started making tunes like literally 10 times faster I used to sit yeah. there there's an ongoing joke I put a lot of memes up about it but people still cuss me to this day but I used to sit there for hours EQing snares and kicks and shit now I don't give a shit <laughs> I'm just like, yeah. like just fuck it and I've got so many friends that are just like, you know, constantly going on and on about, um, you know, how snares are so difficult to make and things like that. And it's just like, find ones that work and just layer them and, and like, get creative yeah. with it. I think actually, hold up, let me see if I can, because I've got my PC. I reckon I can connect to this Zoom call from my PC and show a project and talk about it at the same time. Okay. You just won't be able to hear it, but see it. But yeah, so the way that I really work, it's, um, it's quite cool. I'll just create ideas. So in my drum loops, for example, I'm just going to mute myself in here. So yeah. Hear <clears throat> Go for it. Okay. Can you still hear me? Yeah. All right. Cool. So I'll just start again. So I guess my project when I start new uh, typically looks like this, where I have a drum machine which has all my kicks, all my snares all my collapse, um, all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I've got sort of just a simple sub bass, just a sine wave. I can manipulate this and do whatever I want with it. And then I'll just have like a sample ready, some audio channels. And then here I'll have the hardware all linked up. So I can just, you know, connect to the Moog through here or connect to my no Moog from Peak um, through there mm -hmm. or my system on or my drum machines, whatever. But generally, I'll just start with uh, maybe a drum beat or a sub or a sample that I find. Sometimes, you know. So with the samples, um, I generally make like a pack every month of samples that I find. So whether mm -hmm. it's like I'll splice certain hits that I like, or, you know, kick drums or whatever. Um, sometimes it sort of delves into like synthesizer sounds, shit like that. And then I found like, you know, with splice, a lot of people use it, so I try to sort of deviate away from that a little bit. So I started mm -hmm. just doing sample hunting on YouTube, on Spotify. So, you know, 
looking at I've got this interview here with 1950 master criminal bank robber, shit from Colombo, mm. Indian films, whatever. And then I'll just get those and create loads of mini samples out of them. Um, and then I'll be like, right, I know that I like these because I've made them. And then I'll just, you know, I'll just whack it in as a loop. Maybe click play, have a little play around with it. And then, you know, you start to create like loads right, of loops. Of the project sort of ends up, end up looking like this, where you've got you know, loads of different loops all together. So here's mm -hmm. like a concept, the one that I made. And yeah, it's like, you know, you've got your drum beat, simple shit. Then here, it's just something that I recorded from the Moog. I think this, this is just a pad. I just keep, keep backing the ideas, ideas of one another. And then what you end up with is like something that sort of looks like a vague track. You can then just take these and start going. I mean, what I do is I'll just make one that has everything in it like this. Yeah. I'll copy all of these and I'll go, cool. I'll just take it all the way up to like, I don't know, uh, something like three minutes or something like that. Yeah. And then I'll fuck this off. So now I'm, I'm like in a range mode now. Like, right, I've got something that looks like a track. track. It's, all, it's, 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 a, it's a massive amount of loops. But it looks mm. like a track. So intro, I'm like, right, I don't want drums. Don't want this, don't want that. Fuck them all off. So now that's a basic intro. And then, you know, going through it all, you can just pick out little things that you want. And the cool thing is, if I open another template, I've got a new one. Okay. This is what's great about Bitwig as well, um, just for the people watching. Um, you know, in Ableton, you've got like a, you know, you can save a default template and you can, you know, open a project that is saved as a default template. But Bitwig's got multiple template folders that you can save into and have different sessions like backed up. So you could have yeah. like a sound design session or a mixing session and like have it all just saved in the templates folder. It's just really good for workflow. Yeah, no, it's really, it's really good. Um, so yeah, when I have all the loops, I've just opened my a template so you can actually see what it looks like. Obviously, I haven't mm -hmm. got any loops here. But what I've done is, is I've put these markers in. So I'm like, intro, 16 bars usually. Then D stands for drop, so drop one. Then after eight bars, do a big change. After that, do a middle eight, so maybe cut everything out. Just do a massive flip then build up again to drop two now. So rather than just having one drop and then a breakdown and a second drop, it's more of every eight bars, try and do a big change and have a series of different drops. So this song has, I think, drop one, then drop one, another big change. So that could be adding something new in or taking something out, just changing it a lot. Then the middle eight, it's like, you know, it could be like a bridge or something. And then you've got drop two, which could be the second drop, but it's really early on. It's only like a minute in. Then you do the same thing again. On that drop two, you make a big change again. And then you do what I call drop 1.5. So I'll copy this one, take it over here, but do something completely different with it. So flip it around. And then I'll do the mm. big change again. And then I'll do a bridge, then a breakdown, and then a second drop, then another big change. <laughs> I mean, I'll leave, the, I'll leave the outros as they are because I'm like, I don't know what the outro is going to be. So I try and think of like, I mean, now, I mean, this is like, if you listen to my album, I was not doing any of this. But mm -hmm. on my new tracks, I've done a lot of it. But I'm trying to think of things as rather than just having, you know, like the normal intro and having, you know, 16 and then a breakdown, you know, it's been done before. I'm trying to think mm -hmm. of how can you make the song a bit more progressive? And just by having these mm. labels, it just reminds me what I need to do. And a big change doesn't necessarily have to be like writing a brand new tune. It could just be taking something out. So I think a good yeah. example of a really good arrangement is um, that's a new tune is that Komodo's Lone Shark. So he, he's mm. included middle eights and stuff like that in his tunes where, you know, it drops down, drops in. There's breakdowns in it that feel a lot earlier than before, but it's taking that whole songwriting concept and flipping it on its head or yeah. it's taking a songwriting concept and applying it to dubstep which traditionally dubstep is usually just 16 intro drop another drop breakdown second drop outro sort of thing and i think that's what mm. i've been trying to do and the reason the loops help with this 
is, you know, when you've got loads of loops and you're not thinking about an arrangement, you're just thinking, right, I'm just making loops. When you've got loads and loads and loads, those are all different ideas. Some of them you might not even like, but I try and get as many as I can in there. You find that for all these different little sections in the track, you can refer back to your loops and go, oh, I forgot about that one. Let's add it in. Oh yeah, I forgot. I made this loop. Let's add that in. And you've already got like a palette of loads of different ideas. So rather than thinking uh, about stuff as a track when you're writing an idea, just think of it as strictly an idea. Um, and you're just, you're just having fun, just creating loops, having fun. You know, fuck around with things. You know, if you want to duplicate your uh, drum track, do it. If you want to do, do whatever you can, but there's no rules at all. Uh, there's none. Do whatever you can to make it sound interesting. And I think the first phase of that is just having ideas. And I think that, you know, once you've got all these out, having if you do like hardware you know having something like this so as you can see like this is sort of like a mirror view it's sort of like sideways they are replicates what's on the screen so sometimes i'll just press record i'll just turn the screen off mm. i'll know what all these loops are because i've written them all and i'll just go press record start the intro change it where it feels like it should be changed and by the end of it you know you're gonna have something that looks pretty like vast as a tune i'll show you one that i just finished earlier where I did this whole concept on it. Um, where is it? Oh dear. So yeah, like with all those loops that you have, you can end mm -hmm. up with something that's really like quite technical in sort of as a track is, where you know you've got everything just there. The, all of these were just loops that I made, all different little mm -hmm. loops, and then you just get them all. I've got the song structure here as well. So I try and use these as much as I can, where I'm like, right, this, this bit here is a call and response section. This bit here is gonna be a four bar edit. This one here is gonna be add another sound. This here is like a pick me up. So like, what can you do to add energy back into the track? And then, you know, adding a new thing in. So this is what I was sort of experimenting with that whole concept of, you know, having a structure. Um, and I think, yeah, you know, it's really easy actually to figure out what these structures should be. Like if you listen to, People like Komodo, he's good at it, or someone that's really good, Ivy Lab, they do really sick arrangements. Alex Perez will do mm -hmm. a good arrangement as well where things are constantly changing. Literally, take their tune, put it into the arrangement mode here, and then just start going, right, that's their intro. What have they changed up to here? They changed this, they dropped in. What's the next bit? Like, where have they changed it? And just add these flags. And then you just find mm. out that the structure of the track is all about changing it up as much as you can and like taking as many ideas as you can. And I think like, you know, Perez is, he's one of them ones where, you know, when I've spoken to him or watched videos and stuff, like he, he just jams out. So it's a similar concept to what this is, um, which is why I've called it jam session. So this is my jam session. So I actually start my project inside here. It's like a folder basically mm. that you can enable in. And the thing that's good about Bitwig is you can just isolate a group so if I only want to see my drum bus, for example, um, mm. I'll just go straight into it. I've even got one for referencing. So I've got like, yeah. people that I reference. So for weight, I felt like Alex, I change these all the time. I feel like for weight, Alex Perez's post-mortem has proper weight in it. For like a really subtle dynamic mix down that Lone Shark has it. For something that's really midi, I feel like turning and sound are quite good. And I just, I'll change these all the time. I'll be like, right, for authentic dub tune, I have it in there. And I've just got a button which like flips between them. Um, mm. So when I'm making my track, I can just flick between a reference one and my one and just make sure that the, you know, it doesn't sound shit, basically. I mean, being able to get mixed down exactly the same is impossible. You're never going to be able to do it. But you can still hear, you know, when you're sort of listening to Perez's mixed downs, you know, they're going to be pretty mm. tight. You can hear, like, does it stand up close enough to it you know yeah I you can pause mark it a bit down better than his you know what <laughs> i mean but if if you were to play those tunes side by side with one full flat you know with my one full flat next to it and i think referencing is the most important thing i think when it comes to mixing yeah. it out 100 percent. like if you're not referencing you're either fucking dave Passando, some don or you're deluded yeah. or <laughs> you're just a sick guy who knows what the shit should sound like so you find like People that have been doing it for a long time, like people like Jay Kenzo and that, like, you know, they'll, I, I, I imagine like they might even reference their own tunes from back in the day or reference mm. stuff they've done previously. Where like, I like that mix down. Um, or, you know, but it's always good to just, I don't want to use the word compare, 
it's always good to reassure yourself of the mix down. Because I think a lot of things with mix down is balance and EQing. I think mm. they're the two main things when it comes to mix downs. And I think one person that's really good with mix downs that has a good understanding that I talk to so much, I literally harass this person 24 seven. But Jack Sparrow, he's helped me mm. so much with my mix downs. Um, you know, I'll send him a tune and he'll be like, you know, remove this frequency, add this in. Like he understands all the frequency. So what I've been getting into a lot of is I used to do like a lot of EQing based upon how I wanted the sound to sound like rather than mm -hmm. going, right, there's two stages to EQing. There's color and there's also fixing problems. So with this new Bitwig uh, EQ, I don't even use a Pro Q one anymore because I just want to simplify stuff as much as possible. But what I try and mm -hmm. do is subtract as much as possible in a sound, you know, wherever the problem frequencies are. And then if I want to add color afterwards, I'll just go to something like a UAD EQ because, you know, when you're boosting on these EQs, you're adding color in. Obviously these analog EQs, they have, you know, drive in them, the circuitry is a certain way. They obviously have certain, a certain sound. So I thought, well, rather mm -hmm. than sort of boosting on a normal digital EQ, why not boost something that's going to add something more to the sound? So I'll try and just yeah. subtract EQ as much as I can without taking the essence out of the sound and just removing the peaks and stuff. I mean, I'm still, I'm sure Sparrow is going to watch this. He's going to laugh because, you know, I'm still learning how to do this properly. But there are like mm. some frequency areas that, you know, can be booming, like 300s, quite muddy. Um, you get a lot of boominess around sort of 150. Um, you know, there's certain areas that if you just remove it and then turn the volume up, you find that it achieves the mm. same thing. You're going, oh, I'm just going to do a fucking huge boost. Again, though, there are no rules. I know a lot of producers that, you know, they swear by doing their boosts and that's completely fine. Like, there's no rules. But for me, I find that, you know, just having things simple to start with is the key. So if I was to EQ this kick, for example, I usually just cut my kicks at around sort of 55, 60 around there. Um, mm. Maybe get rid of the tops. But I try and keep it simple. I try and tell myself yeah. if I'm doing more than four EQ points, then the sound's not right, and then I'll have to remove the sound. Um, I try and keep yeah. it to three, but I'll allow four to happen. But any more than that, you're going to create a lot of phase because that's what EQs are going to do. The more sort of change it and boost and remove frequencies. But I just find yeah. that you know, removing stuff and keeping it simple is key. And it all just stems to having the right sound to start with. If you like, I've, I've been hundred percent out a lot with. Like making a tune and like being committed to the vibe of a sound. And then at the end of it, I'm like, for fuck's sake, this sound is not right. And I'm reluctant to change it. And I put myself in positions where I've had to force that sound to work. And it could have worked better if it was another sound. But just the, the vibe and uniqueness of that sound was so good that I had to put it in. So it's always important mm. that, you know, like I was talking about earlier, with my kicks, for example. Is just the 40 kicks that I use. And actually, I've gone in, I've actually renamed all of them as well, just to whatever I right. like, uh, just so they feel like they're mine. They're other people's samples. Some of them I've made, some I've processed differently, but I just tend to just work with just these, nothing else. Um, and yeah. you know, you find like you can get an 808 snare, pitch it down, add a nice spring reverb to it. It's going to work nicely, but it's all about having that sample at the start that sounds good, that you don't have to. Like, yeah. If you've got a sample, that you don't have to do any EQing to. Fucking hell, you've won there, mate. You can literally go, yeah, right, yeah. I don't need shit. delete the EQ, done, and move on. Um, so yeah, like with Bitwig, I start with this whole jamming thing here. And then when I've like gone, cool, I'm ready to make a tune now, I just go to this folder and I hit project. And that's where I've got all my buses set up. So I go, right, I'll grab my drum machine, put it inside the drum bus. I'll grab my sub bass, put it inside. Uh, I usually have a sub bass one. And then, you know, mm -hmm. you've got your jam session. I can literally just hide this now, it's gone. And then we start mixing down. You end up with a whole track where you're mixing down now. So it's two different mindsets completely. So it's good to be able to go into this folder and just isolate it away from everything else. I'm not thinking about making a tune. I'm thinking about just making ideas and having fun. And I think Bitwig enabled this because I quite like using it. I think the user interface is quite nice. 
I think Ableton's good. It does a similar thing. But I find like, you know, the Simpson Bitwig, for example, like the Potty Grid, where you can literally make this full screen and you can make your own synth in here if you wanted. You know, if you wanted to make a synth, it's a basic synth where you've got a pulse wave, a sign, a sawtooth and a triangle, um, all going into a mixer, just like a normal synth. You can easily just do that. And then, you know, do you, what, what do you want to do next? Do you want to have distortion after this? All right, I can add saturation to this. Or maybe I want to split the bands. So, okay, cool. I could do the output of this. I can add a fil two filters on it, a high pass and a low pass, and start sort of creating bands and then processing the bands differently. But I can also output mm. to other things as well. So just having the flexibility of making your own synths, um, that on itself was really, really good. Um, and I made quite a few, not a lot, admittedly. Where are they? Sorry. So like, I made one called Loose Harps, which is just a, a pulse wave and a low pass filter that's being LFO'd. But what I've done is I'm changing the timing of the stepper. So this is just a normal uh -huh. step sequencer. Um, but I've just changed the timing of it using this phase knob, uh, this phase module here. So you see how it's uh -huh. sort of going slow, then it's going fast, then it's going medium, then it's going fast. And then the sound uh -huh. itself sounds unique. And I quite like just sort of, I, I think Bitwig's good for just isolating yourself into something that's within it. If you want to make a synth, uh -huh. you can make it full screen and it feels like its own program. You know, if you want to EQ, you can do it full screen. Like if you're listening to your master and you're trying to figure out problems, you don't want to see all that other shit. You can just go in and everything just works seamlessly. Um, you know, it's really good. I think just the ability to make your own synths is great. But the other amazing thing that Bitwig does, which is its main sort of USP, is you can modulate anything. So I know like in Ableton, you can do, um, with Max for Live, I think you can do LFO and envelope and things like that, where you can add it and then assign it to a knob in MIDI. With mm -hmm. Bitwig, however, you haven't just got an LFO, you've got a four stage, um, a four stage, I guess it's like an MSEG type envelope. Mm -hmm. You've got ADSR, you've got, you know, um, attack, hold, decay, and release. You could do audio sidechain, you could do beat LFO. You can even create a button where you can go, when I press this button, move that up and down. So I've even just like taken that button and maybe I want to do like a stuttery effect or something. I've just assigned this knob to one of the buttons on several of my MIDI controllers, which I can just do here. And now I'm playing, I'm touching the hardware now down here. Mm -hmm. And that knob is just changing. And that, that there is in itself is I'm just getting a musical tactile feel. I don't want to have like a perfectly quantized on the grid sort of yeah. thing. Free, so. You can modulate modulators as well. So you can add an LFO. So if, for example, I just want to filter, just a basic filter, which is, I guess we can use this EQ. I can literally just click it. Add it this just click this button, click the frequency, and I'll do it. But then you can LFO the LFO if you wanted. So mm. add LFO. And I use the LFO loads, but I can LFO this LFO here, which is just going to make, you know, the speed crazy. Or if I want to change the peaks, you know, you can do loads and loads of cool stuff with it. And then, you know, as you're making different sounds and stuff, that's just going to make it sound mental. And I think the thing that's good about Bitwig is so seamlessly integrated that mm. you can modulate anything. I even sometimes when I'm doing my hi-hats, I'll use a hi-hat that has a tail on it. So it's not closed. It's like a sort of, it's got a bit of a tail on it. Mm -hmm. What I'll do is I'll just automate, uh, not automate, I'll modulate an LFO. Again, I love the LFO. The, I'll just do the decay. So obviously the shorter the decay, the shorter the sample is going to be, the longer, the longer it'll be. I'll just do a mm -hmm. very, very small LFO on that. So as that hi-hat's playing, there's no one point where it's sort of going to be just the same sort of sound and the same length or whatever and that just adds that humanized mm -hmm. feel into it and you can you can take this to biddy as well inside of bitwig so if i had loads of fire hat samples like this um, and i wanted to 
change the velocity of them. Obviously, I can do it like the traditional way, where I open this and I just move them up and down. But you can actually do it mathematically as well. So if you select all of them, on the side here, you've got this sort of notes mode. And Silky actually showed me this. But if you go to velocity, you can change the mean, which is basically, I, mean, I don't know what the, the actual term for mean is, but it looks like it's the... the it's the average, point. yeah. Average, yeah. And then you can do the spread and the chaos. So when you do the chaos, you can start getting more, you know, nuanced automation. And, you know, that was effortless. So now this hi-hat mm. sound really good. If I want it to sound even, want it to sound even more, I can add humanize into it, where it's just going to move things. So you see how it's just shifted some of them over. Mm -hmm. And I try and just do that with everything. Um, obviously with hi-hats, like I've got some hi-hats here, which a lot for a lot of the dub stuff I make, I play the hi-hats in and just create like loops or whatever. But sometimes, you know, I'm just like, I just need to get a hi-hat in. And just to give it that little humanized feel, but just taking it off slightly. And the thing mm -hmm. that makes Bitmap so good, it's just so easy to do. There's no faffing around. But I know Bit. I used Ableton. I still think Ableton is great. But with Bitmap, mm -hmm. it's so much better. I mean, you can even do the same thing with um, the gain of the sound or the pitch of it as well. Um, and what's yeah, also I use it all the time. It's great. Yeah. yeah. And what's also really good as well is because it has micro pitch enabled on this. Obviously, I've got my hi hats on a drum machine. So I can't take this MIDI note and move it up and down and change the pitch of the hi-hat. But if I go to this note mode, I can actually change the pitch of it with it per note. So I can go, make that one a little bit, a little bit higher pitch, make that one the same. And you just get those weird, you can do it micro pitch, it's like by 1% or something, but you just get mm. weird little nuances that you would not get with any other MIDI sequencer out there that I know of anyway. And it's just yeah. really um, you can even pitch bend hi hats if you want. So you can pitch bend within MIDI per note on this, and that's just who the fuck's doing that right now? I don't know. And I, I genuinely think Bitwig's the only one that's doing it right now, which is crazy. Yeah, they're, they're honestly killing it, mate. And I think even if you go to like just their stock plugins, you know, they've got a massive, um, you know, they've got a good spectrum analyzer. They've got a oscilloscope as well, which is really good and helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, so you can just see whatever you're playing how it sounds what it looks like one thing that I would love them to add is a little notepad thing because I use a lot of hardware yeah. I have to recall the settings on the hardware a lot it's so annoying I can't just save a preset on an analog pedal for example so I'll just go mm. in say for example uh, on this Novation Peak I'll just add in this little notepad plugin that I've got and just write right, it's this preset 115 on bank C or something and I just remember it and then yeah like I mean you can even do like note effects as well on it um, it's just honestly it's one of them ones where it's so it's so deep and so versatile in how it works that it's almost like it's endless in what you can do with it mm. it's, like, it's yeah. got one of it's it's got an even more active community than Ableton's Max for Live I think as well because it's just so easy to integrate all of the like other users stuff like um you were showing me the other day that bitwigger's website and um on there you can like get all sorts of like all these analog synths that people have spent hours and hours making you just drag it straight into your project from from the like from the website yeah. it's nuts and it's just it works really well because it's, it's brand new code as well um hmm. it's clean code you know they're quite nerdy over there and they're doing constant hmm. updates I mean, silky actually emailed them so when they done version 3.2 which is this one he wanted to be able to just drag a sample into this uh, polygrid which is a thing that you can make a synth on so he emailed them mm -hmm. saying can you make it so that i can grab a sample and just add it into this and they're like that's a great idea and they actually did it so you, there is a little community set, um which is really good i mean silky stuff on here like one it looks like some spaceship stuff man <laughs> i don't yeah. i might have really simple but if you go in here, you can go to, um, you know, these are all people that have made different simps. You can go in and just open their ones. And you can sort of see how advanced things can get in here. Mm. So, I mean, yeah, this simp itself is a whole world of its own. Where, I mean, fucking hell, I have no idea how to make this or what's going on. <laughs> but I guess you could break up each component. I guess the thing is, that's really good. It's like, 
you know, I don't know what, I guess to say, I don't know what this all parts, I know what it does, but I don't know what it does. Like I've, some guys, mm. that have done it. you can click any, any uh, sort of module, I guess, and click show help. And then what it does, it brings up a real time version. So this is actually, I can actually change this. It's the exact same one that's in here. But it tells you what each thing does. And you can just go into any single module and it will give you help of what it does and how it works. And I think that, I think in the latest update they did, this works with their devices as well. So um, any of their sort of in-house plugins, I'm sure if you click that and click show help. Yeah, there you go. So you can actually EQ your sound whilst you're learning what each thing does in the EQ, you know, and it's just, mm. it's honestly the, I've used all of them. I think the one I think that comes close to this one, or the two, is obviously Ableton and FL Studio. I think they're the two, the two, I think this is like a mixture of FL Studio, Ableton, and I think when you go to the mixer side of things, um, it's got this thing in it which I always wanted with Ableton. And I know you can do this mm. hacking, it doesn't work properly, but just having this where you can see the chain or saying, right, I, I want to have a, a big meter. You know, you can just customize it so much that so it just works how you want it to work. I think that's why I like it. Yeah. I honestly, I can't see myself changing. Uh, I think this is it. Because I, I just don't see anyone else, any other program doing this. Like, you can even see like Logic have now added in the whole clip mode now, haven't they? Because they know mm -hmm. that it's a good workflow. So. I think for me, Bitwig, it's probably the most expensive one out there. I think it's like 300 quid. Mm -hmm. but, you know, it is honestly the best program. And it's really, my music's changed immensely since I got it. But it feels like mm. the DW that I always wanted to use. And, you know, if you can get a demo of it, if whoever's watching, I like, think, you know, grab it. Have a little play. You know, if you use Ableton, you're going to be able to get along with it fairly quickly. Yeah, after, after you showed me this software, I think it was literally five days of playing about the demo before I pulled the trigger and I was just like, I'm getting it. Cause Are you it, it now? It, yeah, yeah, I've been using it for a while. Um, unknown to my channel, <laughs> but like uh, I haven't told them that I've been using it, but you know, this is sort of like the big reveal. But yeah, like I'm mo mostly producing on Bitwig now. Unless if I'm doing, um, if I'm doing uh collaborations then i'll do it in ableton because a lot yeah. of people are using ableton yeah but yeah. you know personally yeah that works the one <laughs> it's so fucking good it really is the best man and it's like you know it's the small things like the user interface is really nice to look at i find like i like the colors yeah it you know, feels it, more modern yeah it's just a banger and you know you've got people out there there's this community like to get this thing to work on bitwig i needed like a whole special script and someone out there made one for it so mm. I was like, so I plugged it in, downloaded the script file, added it to the folder, and boom, it just worked straight away. And I'm, I was using it in my workflow instantly. And there's yeah. like a lot of YouTube channels for it. And I think the good thing about Bitwig is that it's the community of it. It's you know, there's a subreddit that's really good. There's also a guy on YouTube called Polarity. There's another guy mm. can't pronounce his name. They're all Dutch or German because it's a German company. But he does yeah. lots MIDI controllers. So I bought this really old uh, Novation controller. It came out in like mm -hmm. 2005 or something. And he wrote a script for it and it works perfectly in Bitwig. So sometimes when I'm mixing down and I just want to get a, you know, a tactile feel, have some faders, I just use this. Mm. And it just, everything just works. Yeah, really sick. Cool. Yeah. yeah, like I've got my Ableton push as well. And like someone like went dived into the code of that and then like repurposed the entire thing so it works like identically to how it would with Ableton but within Bitwig and like the um, the screen changes so I can see all the faders in super high res uh, like all the all the mixer channels mate it's actually mental like, so it, you said I, I, I couldn't get over it push works for Bitwig yeah yeah so uh, someone did a code <laughs> called um, no, push for Bitwig know. and like they repo like I thought it was just going to be like you know basic you know maybe they'll map all the buttons to do similar things but no the actual screen itself shows a, another copy of what's on your screen in terms of like the faders and the, like all the um, the peak meters and the RMS meters and all that all on the screen within um, within push two it's insane wow well I have to look into that don't tell my missus that yeah man anything. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, man, it's, it's nuts.
but yeah, like, you know, I think since I switched to this program and I got a PC that powers it pretty well, I mean, like just making ideas. So like every day I'll just bang out an idea. And I think that's all I care about. I don't care about finishing tunes because I can just select which ones I'm going to do. Like last night, I think I was working on like a dub techie type thing. Well, you won't be able to hear it now because all the synths are disconnected, but you mm -hmm. know, just quickly, I was like, within an hour, I was like, right, let's just try and make a dub tech. So I had my Novation Peak, like I broke my own rule, rule here. Um, but I had an Ovation Peak and the sub bass and you know, the drum kit. Then I was sending the, the snare drums out to the hardware, which is really easy to do. So like, if you do use any hardware effects, they've just got this thing called hardware effects, similar to what Ableton has, but it's got mm. latency, um, I don't know what the term is for it, what's it called? The compensator. Yeah, the compensator, that's it. But also what's really good about it, if I zoom it out, like each channel tells you underneath, you see these little yellow things, it tells you what the latency uh -huh. of the channel is. So if I didn't cool. want to play something in, I could just get a time shift uh, module, put it in, and I can just time shift it exactly by this amount, and then it'll be in time. So it's like, you know, they're starting to add little things in where you can see the EQ shapes here, which is what I'm using. Oh, I don't know where it is. Uh, here it is, yeah. So mm. it's just a, it's just a good tool. But like even things like splitting the frequencies. So one thing I've been getting into quite a lot is processing the sideband a little bit, just to make it pop a little bit more. So in this one, because mm -hmm. it's like quite an analog sounding tune, I've just taken the side, and I've just added a bit of saturation to it with a sort of 50% mix. Just makes it more crunchy, but the mere fact that yeah. I can do that is amazing. Or if I just wanted to split the frequencies, I know in Ableton you can do it with, uh, I think people, a lot of people use that multi-band thing. Where you Dynamics, can, yeah. yeah. But this you just go to, I want to split it by three frequencies. And you just dump in whatever plugins you want, any plugins, so here's like a Waves one. Fuck Waves, by the way. <laughs> Some dodgy political shit going on with them, mate. Read into it. And Is Native it? Instruments as well, yeah. Have you read about Native oh, Instruments? Oh, yeah, no, I know. I, I have heard about Native Instruments, yeah. 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 I don't really use crazy it. shit, man. But yeah, you can just literally, without having to use another tool, there's a tool dedicated to it. And you can just mm. go in. But you know what else you can do? You can modulate all this shit as well if you wanted. So I can say, like, yeah. if I have a sub bass that had like a really fizzy sound in it, and I wanted to split the frequency of the sub bass, so I only wanted the fizzy sound to be in the highs. I can go, as soon as the MIDI note of that sub bass hits, add an envelope to this high thing here, where it just brings it in and then cuts it off a certain time. And I don't know any other DAW where you can do that as seamlessly as this. I know you can do it, but I just yeah, want to do Yeah, but it's a massive faff. Yeah, I just don't want to fuck around and like, I don't know, like, I'm, I'm already a bit of a habitual faffer as well, so I try and just fucking get on with it. Um, mm. And I think, like, you know, some of their stock plugins, yes, it's early days for them. Some of them leave a bit to be desired. But, you know, I've managed to get, I think their reverb is not a great sounding reverb. But then mm. I realized, you know, it's just, their reverb is just basic. But then I saw mm -hmm. this, shit. I can add effects to the tank of the reverb. So if I want it to sound distorted or I want to EQ it or do whatever, compress it, I don't know. And I can also add effects of the wet. So I think they leave you open with all the possibilities of anything. You know, you can do anything. And I think when I was first using it, the thing that confused me the most that I missed from um, Ableton was like in the sampler, I was like, oh, where's the pitch control? Like, where's the LFO? Where is everything? What the fuck? This is shit. Mm. When I realized you could just make all your own ones. So I can go, right, um, give me an envelope. I can make my own pitch envelope. Piece of piss, done. Pitch envelope, done. I want to do an LFO. Oh, the LFO isn't just limited to the filter. I can LFO anything. So it's almost like they give you all the building blocks to be able to build something and put it together yourself. Yeah. That's, that's why I like it. It's, there's no one way to do anything. There's probably 10 different ways you can do something. And whatever way works for you. Yeah. I, th I think... Um... The way that I describe it to like friends and people that are getting, you know, sort of asking questions about it, because like, you know, before I got onto Bitwig, I was like the you know biggest diehard Ableton fan, and then Ooh. I found this, and and then like I was like screaming and shouting about Bitwig, and 
everyone was like, what's, you know, what is so cool about it? Like what makes it so unique? It's like, if you're a super nerd and you're really into music and like the sound design process and things like that, um, and you want ultimate flexibility, Bitwig just gives it to you on a plate and no other DAW does it as well as they do. Nah. Um, it's really something special. I couldn't believe it. And, you know, I've been doing some tunes with Silky as well. And like, we're just sending things back and forth. You know, it, it, it just works seamlessly. And it's just nice to be able to see how sort of he's doing stuff. Um, mm. all, I mean, he, set up, he came over and set up my computer for me because I had no fucking idea how to do it or whatever. Um, mm. So we've got like, similar plugins and shit, which have all been paid for. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, like, it's just, it's so fun, man. Like, when I open it, I feel like I'm about to have fun. I don't feel like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing and I feel lost. And I think just little things that they've improved mm. on Ableton. On Ableton, you have to go to this top bar to zoom in and out. With Bitwig, you just mm. click down on your middle mouse button anywhere, yep. move or zoom in and out. Mm -hmm. So, like, yeah. they've really just considered everything. Even if you wanted to change all your shortcuts, you know, you've got all your key shortcuts here. You can change anything. Mm. Um, you can add, I've got like an excessive amount of MIDI controllers. They all work pretty well. You know, it gives you a CPU meter as well. So you can see how fucked things are. As you can see, things are quite fucked right now in this particular project. Mm. Um, <laughs> I'm not linking it through my UAD. But it just does. It'll everything. also be because we're screen sharing as well. Yeah. It just <laughs> does everything. And, you know, I'd recommend that anyone sort of looking for a more of a, a creative and fun experience should definitely just try it out. 100%. Nice one, man. That's really sick. Um, so I've got some questions as well, just to like wrap things up because you know yeah. you, you've you've run down through all, all the stuff that I was going to ask you about, like you know mixing techniques and sound design, your oh, sound yeah. design process, and you've you've gone through it all, man. So like oh. I didn't even have to ask the questions; you just did it all <laughs> for me. Sorry, man. <laughs> I <hope> not, mate. <laughs> That's cool, man. Mate, you're the, you're honestly like the perfect guest. This is this is fantastic. Um, so let me just get these questions up real quick. No worries. Uh, where is it? Okay, so I've got one from my mate Nathan. Uh, he said, um, I wouldn't mind his take on dealing with creative blocks. So, you know, we're all artists, we all sort of get along, uh, get our fair share of creative blocks. How, how do you, over the years, how have you sort of figured out how to get out of them? Um, yeah, it's a weird one, isn't it? Uh, I think like there's two ways. One way, I'll just leave it. I don't bother. I don't bother making tunes. I'll just go, fuck it. My brain's not in it. I'll fuck off. Mm -hmm. I'll play Call of Duty or Xbox or whatever. And play my guitars. But I will not sit in front of the computer if there's no point in doing that. Um, but another mm -hmm. creative block, it's... I find like creative blocks are usually like self-doubt, I find. Um, there's this one book that I read, actually if he wants to read it a little bit, it's really helpful for this sort of thing. So I'll just check it cool. out. It's called um, The Artist's Way. And what she tells you to do, which I tried, it worked really well for me, she goes, as soon as you wake up, before you brush your teeth, before you do anything at all, get have a book like a notepad next to you and just write your how you feel and what your thoughts are. You can write anything at all. And she'll go, the more and more you do that as a creative, you're going to start writing about things like, oh, I've got to make a tune today, or oh, today I've got to finish this tune, or finish this mix out, or today I've got to go see my mum, or whatever. And she finds that by getting all those things out of your head onto this notepad, you're like confronting and making yourself aware of the things that make you feel like you can't do things, or you're doing things that you don't want to do, or you could do things better, or whatever. And she says mm. in this that, what's the term she uses? There's a word she uses for it. It's called oh, sensor. So, Listen to this. So imagine your sensor, sensor mm -hmm. is your creative block. She says, think of your sensor as a cartoon serpent slithering around your creative Eden, hitting vile things to keep you off guard. If a serpent doesn't appeal to you, you might find a good image of what it looks like, like a shark or whatever. But what she's basically saying here is that that creative block is, I find I get a creative block there when I'm being a little fucking prick and I'm like, oh, this person's made this tune. I want to try and do something similar. And then I can't do it. Mm. You don't, it doesn't mm. work that way. Or I find it when I'm comparing shit to other people, the creative block comes. 
But mm-hmm. again, think, right, I'm not, I don't have to make tunes for anyone. I do it for myself and that's it. Just write ideas. Even if they're shit, doesn't matter. Write an idea, man, like a, just a simple drum beat with a melody, anything. Mm-hmm. Or don't sample something. That's even another sick one. Headland told me this one. He was like, when he's got a bit of a block, he's like, it's sample hunting time. He'll go out, find a sample, mm. do it, and then a sample will, you know, trigger off something creative in his mind. And it's just finding out the different avenues and understanding why you've got a block, but also, you know, just go find new sounds, faff around. Like, you know, I found that most of the tunes that I wrote, like that Godsmack tune or, you know, some of the tunes from the album, they were all written because I was just fucking around. That was a Godsmack mm-hmm. tune. I made the melody on my mood. I was just fucking around with it. I didn't even sit down to go, I want to make this God's Snap tune. I just sat there and was like, I'm just going to fuck around in the synth, but I'm just going to record all of it. And then I made that mm. melody. And that whole tune came from that hook. And that was it. Job done. Mm. And I find like, you know, if you are into hardware or, you know, like, you know, you've got that Ableton push, like it, it removes the computer, it removes the keyboard and mouse and you can just creatively make stuff. Sometimes I'll just click record on my computer with one of my synths and I'll just play on that synth for like an hour whilst it's all recording. And then whilst I'm in bed or I'm just chilling, I'll just listen back to it all and I'll have a stopwatch. So I'll click play on the file and click start on a stopwatch. And I'll just do a lap for every time I hear a sound that I like. And then I'll take that file back to the computer and go, all right, at five minutes, there's a six sound, go to five minutes, I'll cut that out. And you know, go to this time, I'll cut that out. And a lot of times, I'll I've made loads of tunes just from fucking around and just making a, a really, really long recording of just one synth or one mm. instrument. If you get a MIDI controller or you've got like a keyboard, you can do the same thing on the computer. It's not like a hardware thing. But it's just all about why have you got a creative block in the first place? I always find personally I get a creative block and I'm trying to, trying to unnaturally do something. Yeah. And I'm not achieving but that thing. It's like what uh, Ed Sheeran said in this interview. Remember, he was like, um, you know, to get to like a certain level uh, of doing anything, you just need to do things naturally and let the shit water flow until the water runs clear. And, you know, it's it's figuring that stuff out about yourself. And like normally when you run into a creative block, it's when you've got in your head that the water's still shit. And, you know, and and you're too self-aware and you're not, you're not, you're focusing on like the right there and then and not the bigger picture. And it's about just going through the, going through the motions and just sort of figuring it all out, you know? Yeah, man. I mean, like this is a, this is my Google drive of all the ideas that I've made that have mm-hmm. gone nowhere. Like literally there's loads, Hun- like literally probably over a thousand in here. These are all literal yeah. ideas that I have not taken anywhere or I don't like them at all. <laughs> in the last maybe year. Mm -hmm. So like one thing I try and do is, because I know that people get very keen on the whole, you know, creating a new idea every time. It's hard to finish something off. So I I noticed I was getting into that. So I just created a folder called Priority and that's it. This is all I will work on. Even in my, on my Bitwig, which I reshare now. um, On my Bitwig, I do not have any, like even here, for example, like I can do that. So I finished the black box of tunes done. You know, I can delete certain things, whatever. Like, and I'll make sure that in here, this is all I'm working on. I do not deviate mm-hmm. from it. You'll never get anything done otherwise. Mm-hmm. Um, like there's a few things here I need to finish. Like this, I'm doing like a little dub remix of that Norman Bates tune, or me and Mr. K cool. doing something with a dub tech tune or ghetto tech tune by Soul, which we need to finish. Mm-hmm. But I'll just make sure like, you know, I'm not working anything else and if I do work on something else it's one in one out so I only have I'll only be working on eight things at a time if I go oh yeah. I'm gonna make a new product. oh I really like that I'll be like well you got to get rid of one of these then so that also helps create a block and having some direction on finishing shit that you've already started so I'll use the creative block time to finish stuff because I'm like well all the creative stuff's been done how can I go in and just go right finish this tune off and then get it done and I think, yeah, that's, mm-hmm. that's really the key. If you've got old ideas where you were creative sitting in a folder somewhere, pull them out. Set yourself a deadline. Go, right, by the end of today, I want to have a basic arrangement on this tune. And I find that a lot of the time, like, 
the, the arrangement and mix down is a thing that stops people finishing a tune. I think the idea is mm-hmm. always be enough there to get going. You might need to add a few bits and bobs in here and there, but I think like, it's always like the arrangement of how should it be. And the mix down is another fuckery. I mean, you know, I found like I, I went through all the motions of mix downs, mate. I used to have EQs that fucking look like this and shit, taking all the life out mm. of the sound, adding too much life in. And I realized, nah, what the fuck am I doing, man? I keep it as simple as possible. Like sometimes I'll just go, I won't even use the EQ. I'll just use a filter that has a high cut and a low cut. And that's it. Mm-hmm. And I think like one tutorial that's really good is um, I think on Audio Science Amit's site, um, Jay Kenzo tutorial, he goes through one of his tunes. And like his mix downs. Uh-huh. And you can see he does fuck all. He just picks the right sound. And... He, he yeah. puts all his energy into making that sound unique rather than trying to make it fit in the mix because he selected a sound that fits in the mix. You know what I mean? So he'll literally be like, I just rolled off that and I've rolled off some of the tops and that'll be his EQ. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, I'll open one of my files and I'll be like thinking I'm fucking doing mathematics or something like dipping shit out, yeah. adding shit, doing too much. And it's like, if you've got to do that much, is the sound right, firstly? Or are you just EQing? Like I used to find I was, EQ- I was cutting things just for the sake of it. When the Spectrum mm-hmm. Analyzer was showing that I didn't need it, or maybe I did want to keep it. Like Sometimes you get into this habit of thinking we have to do something when you don't actually have to do anything. You can just leave yeah. it. So, uh, why, it's, why it's some of my like, patrons and like, people that are supporting me, you know, they're doing like, one-to-one lessons with me and that, it's like, you know, when it comes to mixing and things like that, you need to make sure that everything that's in the track has its own space. That's and it. what an EQ is doing is just, you know, most of the time I'm only using high and low, pa- like, you know, the shell, uh, the, um, you know, what you were just showing there, the, the high cut and low cut. And, um, you know, just making sure that everything sits in a space and it's got its own place to breathe because as soon as you start overlapping frequencies, that's when you start doing the crazy EQ moves and like, you know, you're inevitably adding phase issues to the track and things like that. So yeah, it's, it's good to see that good to see that you're doing the same thing. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I don't even have an EQ on my chain. So if I open up a new project, just to really show you. Cause I know like Ableton has, um, Ableton has a thing in it, doesn't it? On its sampler, uh, filter. Uh, which, yeah. Yeah, so most of the time I'm just going like this. Take the resonance Same. out. That's it. I don't even need an EQ. I just got. I have an EQ here, just because I know I'm probably going to have to EQ something at some point. But mm-hmm. sometimes I deactivate it and leave it. I don't even bother with it. I mean, I gain stage everything. Um, mm. Make sure that I usually have it at like minus ten. Yeah. Um, just to make sure that you know everything's nice or whatever. But a lot of the time it's just this knob. Removing the top. Yeah. Um, so the good thing about Bitwig is that it's got this EQ in it called EQ2. So you can do all your shit on it, but if you're like, actually, I need to go in, rather than having to open another EQ and replicate that, you can right click it and go upgrade to EQ plus. So it just takes that simple EQ that you have and it just Ooh, adds it. Didn't know that. Yeah. But nice. I to keep it simple. Um, and I never used it before. I used to have fucking mm. chains bollocks on my chains mate like literal bollocks like <laughs> i think if you're going to do loads of eqing and stuff or loads of processing make sure that it's only you're only doing it because it's a creative choice don't do it because you're trying to make it fit in the mix otherwise uh-huh. it's not at all um and that's yeah definitely but even one thing i started getting into recently is just adding a little compressor at the end of each drum uh, at the, on my kit sort of, just a little bit not some mad amount mm-hmm. just like the smallest amount just to control the peaks and I found just having that little bit of compression helped with headroom and things like that and you know with distortion for example I try and like layer a small amount of several distortions rather than one big one to do you know one task so I think just keep yeah. it simple and every decision just make it for a reason I think I sort of deviated from yeah. that but yeah sorry <laughs> That's all right. Uh, I, it, you know, it brought up another thing that I wanted to bring up as well. Um, you know, I find that leaving the sound as original as possible, like a lot of the time now, I'm, I'm not even, um, 
I'm not even throwing f- inserts like straight onto a sound. A lot of the time I'm parallel processing that sound to keep a lot of the original flavor in it as well. Cause, um, you know, sometimes there's like, a, 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 you know, there might be like a low end characteristic to a kick, which is, you know, really raw and I, I want to keep it there, but I, I want to saturate the tops, but not, saturate over the whole thing and make the entire thing wet and it's like you know yeah. uh, parallel processing is like highly important to keep the original character of the sound because once you find something that's so unique but you just need to do a little bit of extra polish into it you know parallel processing is great for that sort of thing yeah man i mean i, I use the parallel stuff quite a lot like same as uh ableton and bitwing for this group stuff but then yeah uh, which does you know similar shit um yeah i think you know I, I mean, ultimately, I try and have as, li- as little effects and stuff on my track as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, unless it's a creative choice. So, like, you know, something that I've got on all my snares is just a reverb, but I haven't got it activated or anything. Like, it dries down. But I've just got mm-hmm. it hooked up to one of my MIDI controllers so I can just instantly go in. Rather than cool. clicking the menu, finding the reverb, I can just go, I want a reverb. I might change this reverb later, but I just want a reverb for the mm-hmm. line. Just got it all hooked up in the template, ready to roll. So I could just go boom, nice. close it. I don't even need to look at it. I could do the same thing with delay as well. I could do a lot of the sort of dummy shit. So I can just go, yeah, done. There's a delay in there. I'm sorted. Don't need to worry nice. about it. Um, so I try and like not use a computer as much as I can. But obviously, you're going to have to, aren't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's certain things that, you know, even when you're using the push, which is designed to like sort of use Ableton away from the computer, you still need to reach for the mouse for certain things. Um, yeah. So, Car on the Discord group as well. Um, how do you get picked up by Temper so fast? I think we went over that. Um, yeah. yeah. And then a guy called um, N for Me, he's asked, uh, ask him how he went about learning sound design. Did he watch tutorials, messing around show, um, until he found somebody he liked, school, taught by friends, etc.? How, how did you go about it? Um... What, like creating synths and stuff? Yeah, just Any- like, um, you know, le- learning the basics of like sound design in terms of like bass, because I know he's really interested in like sort of like heavy mid bass sounds and things like that. I think he's just like, how did you learn about bass design and, um, you know, learning um, your way around synths? Was it videos and that? Yeah, like a lot of videos. I think everyone probably started on this bad boy. I think everyone knows what yeah. this is. <laughs> but yeah, a lot of videos. But I think I learned more about synths in the last six months that I have the whole time by using this polygrid um, just because because mm-hmm. um, you're making it yourself you understand the signaling of it but I think like having yep. hard, I'm not saying everyone should go and get hardware but having a hardware synth where it's not connected to the computer and you're getting a feel for what each knob does I think that helped me understand it a lot um, with like drums and stuff you know I'll try and find a reference but I don't you know I think for like a really good dubby snare with a good delay, I'll listen to a lot of dub music and go, right, what sort of sound am I going for? And then I'll try and replicate it somehow for effects or whatever. Um, but a lot of it, yeah, a lot of it's videos. Um, Reddit's really good for that. I think there's one called something like How to Make This Simple, something like that, but where people mm-hmm. go, I want to try and make this sound, and then someone will come and go, this is what it is, and they'll do a breakdown of it. But I think, yeah, sound is yeah. like just fucking around, to be honest with you. Flapping yeah, around. the Kilo Hearts um, Discord channel, you know, the guys who make uh, Phase Plant, oh, um, yeah. They've, yeah. they've got a Discord channel, which is um, specifically to the people who just make sounds using Phase Plant. And like, people will upload a, tr- a song or something and be like, I want to know how to make that bass then. And someone will just upload a patch and just be like, yeah, this is how I did it. <laughs> like, yeah. within, a, within a day. It's great. Yeah, I think one thing um, that Sook showed me, Sook Knight, he goes, he sent me all of his like old... Um, simps that he made for True Tiger and mm. he was like you because I was like I, I, I honestly one of the worst things I think I'm, I do is like mid sounds and simps I, I hate them I find them quite difficult but mm-hmm. if I go to BST presets so here's all the presets I've done I think there should be True Tiger one here something so he was like go in open any of them and then open another channel or like try and reverse engineer the sound mm-hmm so I think like I mean he never said open another channel. He was like get get the get the preset and try and remake it on another channel. Mm-hmm. So that was another way that you can learn is literally go right. He did this on the feedback. Try and do it. He did this, and then you just understand what each knob does because you're actually building the synth from sort of ground up. 
So that's another. Yeah, and you're thing. hearing the progress of it. Yeah. Yeah, like reverse engineer and presets is a really good one. How to learn. But I find for mm-hmm. me, it's like mostly just fucking around, man. But I've been using this synth. I've been using loads. The new one that I've got. The P. But yeah, so good. Yeah. Really, just intuitive to use. But I felt I found that I learned like so much of the stuff that I learned on. I think like Serum and all that stuff, I could translate to this pretty well. Because mm-hmm. a lot of it was like FM synthesis and shit like that. So, you know, a lot of it's just fucking around and just knowing what the basics are. But obviously like to someone mm-hmm. who doesn't, really, if you don't know how a synth works, it's good just to start with the basics of what's an oscillator, what's yeah. an uh, effect. But most of it's There's loads around. of great eBooks out there, uh, like PDF things of just like how a subtractive nice. synth works. And it's really easy to visualize all that sort of stuff. So for people struggling out yeah, there, no, it's, like it's fun though. find an eBook. Yeah. Like you can just literally just open massive, record the audio out of that channel, fuck around and then fuck around for half an hour. If you can record for half an hour then listen back, mm. you've got sounds. <laughs> you won't know how to recreate Definitely. them. You've got them. You've made them. I don't think anyone really sort of, uh, unless you're like some synth genius, I don't think anyone sort of knows how to 100% make a sound that they haven't already made before. I think a lot of it's fucking around yeah. and you go, right, now I know how to make that. Yeah. No, unless you're like doing sound for like movies and stuff and like, you know, you're making alien effects and, oh, you know, yeah. you work at like a Foley studio or something like, you yeah. know, but like most, most electronic music producers, they're just dicking about <laughs> it's happy accidents yeah 100 percent, man that's what it is happy accident yeah <laughs> um there's one more question i can't remember where it is hang on uh where is it sorry mate bear with hey you're right i'm just checking my heart rate for fun <laughs> I've got these things really good. <laughs> now I've just had really bad asthma, which is why I was on the phone to the doctor. Um, my allergies right. fucked. So they were like, obviously, when you find it hard to breathe, you probably get a bit anxious. So they told me to get one of these. I've got asthma as well. Yeah. How's your asthma been with all this shit? So mine's all right. I had it like as a as a child, but like it, you know, there, there has been times where I've woken up like mid sleep, and it's been like really you know, kind of worrying. Like I had to reach my inhaler a couple of nights ago. Um, wow you know, for the first time in years, like, so yeah, it's, it's been weird. Apparently it's all the pollen in the air. Yeah, it will be. Like, the thing is though, I, I'm like mad allergic to olive tree pollen, which isn't very common here in the UK, like, but, um, yeah, me yeah too. I'm like 98% allergic to olive tree pollen <laughs> and like, yeah, it's, it's, it's really weird. I had a, yeah, crazy allergic to it. I went to this, I, I, I've got, I paid for a private allergy test. And they were like, your allergy to grass and Timothy grass is literally mm. pretty, pretty fucking bad. And I live on like, mm. a, I sort of live half in the sticks and there's loads of, um, that I've got in the communal garden, there's a massive green, green there and they're yeah. cutting it to make it look nice and all that shit. And I was just like, fucking hell, mm. man. I'm allergic <laughs> to dogs as much as I am to grass. So, yeah, yeah, so am I. Yeah, yeah, it's nuts. <laughs> Um, right, so if you're taking questions, tips for sub bass and bass lines and how to make them resonate on different speakers. I think this question is more about um, like translation. Oh, yeah. um, so, like, you know, ha- like how did you figure out? Because obviously, you know, you play out a lot and um, you sort of, you know, you test tunes on systems and things like that. Yeah. Um, but early, early days, how did you go about sort of? ballpark in to get a bass to sound right like a sub bass yeah like sub bass is like when you know, it's getting to translate properly on a system and that yeah i mean i'd reference a lot so that would mm-hmm. be the first thing is like you know i don't how loud should a sub bass be i'd listen to someone mm-hmm. else's tune look at their tune and the analyzer and try and match it um with like translation of tunes and sound systems like i tend to mix down in mono anyway um, mm-hmm. and then I'll, I'll flick to the stereo. So that always helps with translation to sound system because obviously they're mono. So I've got a button mm-hmm. here, flick, so I'll keep this on. I'll make a whole tune or whatever on this, then I'll flick to stereo like that. And sometimes if I just want to hear mm-hmm. the sides, the side bands, 
of how wide it is, whatever, I'll flip to there. But I think referencing is the key for that. And also yeah. everything in mono um, is going to give you a very clear indication of how it's going to sound in the sound system. Saying that mm -hmm. though, nothing beats actually playing it on a sound system. I was chatting to yeah. um, Chris from uh, Day2 the other day. And obviously they run the Green King's Cuts um, sound system. Mm -hmm. and they put it up. I was like, I'm so fucking jealous. Like, they can literally make yeah. a tune in the studio, walk into another room and test it on a massive sound system. I mean, they're lucky mm -hmm. guys. Man. But yeah, if you, can, and, uh, if you can test it somehow or get people to play it, I mean, that's always going to help. But I think mono is probably the main thing. Obviously, referencing it in different headphones and all that stuff is quite useful. Mm -hmm. I blew one of my headphones yesterday. I was really annoyed. Oh, shit. <laughs> but, yeah, but, but the sub bass is all about referencing and just see how loud other people's are. Um, I think, you know, sub bass wise, I tend to keep it fairly simple. It's usually yeah, just it's usually the way. Um, then I'll add like a, I don't know, like a saturator or something to it. I mean, I've been, I've been adding mm -hmm. this. Sparrow, Sparrow's been telling me it's wrong, but I think it sounds nice. But I'll put the sub <laughs> saturator, boost it a little mm -hmm. bit, and then just cut off whatever I don't want and yeah, okay. like, so you get just those extra harmonics um, mm -hmm. but most of the time it's just simple simple stuff but yeah, try and yeah. Make sense. that usually helps sort of I, hear, helps you hear things I think a lot of the times when like producers are sort of starting out or like in the early stages they think that um you know the key to getting a sub to sound sick is to do loads to it but in reality less is more and I think that's that follows for a lot of things. Um, it's just about you know, balance, isn't it? Um, Volume, obviously. yeah, because you know, fundamentally, you're cramming so many different sounds into a single piece of audio. Like you know, if you're doing too much to all the individual bits, it's just going to end up sounding messy because you're doing too much. <laughs> yeah, man. and I've been it's there. a balancing <laughs> act. Yeah, it's man, fun. we all have. <laughs> it's fucking horrible, man. I can't stand it, mm. but you know, you have to, you have to do it. It even got to the point yeah, where I was you... paying other people to mix my shit down. And I was like, nah, man, mm. just fucking, you've got to go through the paces of failing to know how to get it right. And I still haven't got it right. Yeah. Honestly, like, I yeah, have tunes on the system and they won't sound like how I thought they would, but, you know, it's, it's hard, man. Sometimes I get, like, if I, play, I hate playing my tunes for the first time out loud. My face gets all red. Mm. Yeah. I'm, like, I'm about to play it, it might sound shit. But you gotta do it, you gotta know. The thing is as well, like the the most gut wrenching thing about it is like in reality, you're the only person who like because you're the only person who's heard it in your studio before it's been played out. So this is the first time other people are gonna hear it. So like even if the idea slaps and it sounds a bit off, it's the idea that slaps. But for you it's like, oh shit, it sounds awful because I didn't expect this frequency to pop out like crazy. But like, you know, the average listener is not gonna give a shit about that. They're listening yeah. to the melody and the bass and the feel of it. So, you I know, mean, it's something you get used to. 100%, man. Like, I was chatting to Strategy the other day. I, I Honestly, I think his mix downs are sick. He seems to think otherwise. Mm. And I realised, you know what? Every producer probably hates their mix downs, isn't it? Like, they probably don't like them. Yeah. You've got to yeah. be your, your, your own worst critic. So, I think if you, can, if you can mix in mono, I think that's the first step of reference. They're the two things. Because... I think like stereo gives the illusion of volume in certain places. Um, mm -hmm. But I've started doing like loads of mid-side EQing and like, you know, I'll just do it on my drum bus at the end. I'll use Pro mm -hmm. Q for it. I find it to be easier to do it on there. Mm -hmm. If I'm like the drums aren't popping enough, you know, I'll do a little, a little boost or something for the mid somewhere or sort of mm -hmm. like this. Or like that. I don't know if it's right, but when I translate it to mono, it sounds more similar to the stereo one. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, little things like that. But yeah, if you can get people to play out your tunes even better. But you could go to places like, yeah. um, you know, like Pirate Studios. They've got like mm -hmm. mini sound systems in their practice rooms. So you can check stuff on those. Mm -hmm. And if you've got a PA system. I think there are some um, plugins you can get where you can emulate different speakers and stuff. Mm -hmm. and I, can't, I can't remember what it's called. There's one in Waves. I can't remember what it's called. But you can literally just hear what it sounds like on a car stereo. If you've got a car... Like if, the, if you listen to it in mono and stereo in as many different places as you can, headphones in the car and all that, you're going to come up with a balance between all of them eventually. And it should sound yeah. easy. Reference. That's the key. See what... Befriend. Yeah, my, my tip is befriend your local sound system guy. 
because nice. um, there's 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 one near you, and they're all friendly because they're all base heads just like you. So, <laughs> you know, go go out, meet them, chat to them, yeah. get along with them, <laughs> like. <laughs> And then just send them some tunes and just ask them, like, hey, how does this sound? And he just, you know, I've got like three mates that own sound systems. You know, they, they test the tunes on there and they're just like, yeah, mate, fucking slaps. I'm like, all right, sick. <laughs> Move yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, that's, 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 a good, that's a good one. Yeah, definitely. If you got, in fact, another good one, sub, the sub pack. I had one, but I broke yeah. it. But that's another good way is if you can get your hands on the sub I'm pack. I'm waiting on the new one. Yeah. They're bringing out a new one real soon. Oh, yeah, that's sick. Yeah, yeah. Man, sub pack will give you a good gauge. But it's all sort of then you'd have to reference your sub you'd have to reference the sub pack with another tune. Because sometimes it might mm-hmm. be too loud. I've got a problem where, you know, I'll send a lot of my stuff to Sparrow and he'll always say two things. Snare is too loud, sub is too loud, or sub is too quiet. <laughs> yeah. It's a fine line. Like it's, those few DBs up and down is gonna make a lot of difference. Yeah, it, it totally changes like the sound of your master as well because like if you produce into like a limiter or something and like your sub's too quiet and everything else is too loud, like you know it's the, everything else in the track is like what's pushing into your limiter, and then the sub sounds like too diminished. Or if you're pushing the sub too loud, everything else sounds squashed. And like you know, it, it is a really fine balancing act, especially with bass music. Yeah, I've got like I used this preset which Icicle showed me. Well, he basically put it on one of my mm. tunes. And it back, I just stole it. But yeah, I think it's yeah. <laughs> punchy. But this this menu is really good for like. I find that some tunes can't work for punchy. Like they can't. I can't get enough mm. out of them. You know? Um. Again, like it's all about just keeping it simple. I know, like you know, trends and boiling, boiling. He mixes yeah. mixes into a limiter, which I found like mad. But you know, it works for him. So there's no like hard and fast rules. It's just I mix into a limiter as well. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've tried to mix into a limiter, but then as soon as I take the limiter off, everything's fucked. Yeah. Or the snare is far too loud. It's always the snare, man. I've got snare problems. <laughs> My snares are too fucking loud. I've, I've got a crazy mixing template where I, um, I mix all my bosses into limiters, and then I, then I have a limiter on the master as well. So yeah. I basically use limiters as like extreme compressors with like an infinite ratio. Nice. And get everything balanced in there, get it all sounding punchy and like smooth and like the drums, I'll use the transparent feature in pro L and then for other things I'll use like modern or all round, nice. um, you know, for like, and then get a balance with it like that. And then just like, then basically I've got as much, you know, I, I can push things up to like minus four, minus three if I wanted to, and it all sounds real clean, nice. um, which is way more than what you'd need, but <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. I mean, yeah, it's, it's just, uh, it's like what you said, just fitting everything in and making sure that you're controlling it as much as you can. But one guy, I saw mm-hmm. a YouTube channel. Let me see if I can find it. Um, there's a bloke on YouTube. Sub mixing. I think it might be this guy. Mm-hmm. It's, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not sub bass. It's like mixing. So what he does is he'll do all his buses and then he'll send yep. things out the bus into another set of compressors um, yeah i think it's like i think it might be this one i think it might be this blake i'm not sure i'll find the video and i'll send yeah. it to you it's really interesting because what he said was it's like you can use different compressors for different frequency bands of different types of sounds like you would your mm-hmm. buses and you do it again afterwards just a little bit and he says it just gives it that extra oomph on it I yeah, I've seen it. I, um, I, I know which one you're on about. I like this. It's the almost identical technique that I use, but instead of yeah. using his compressors technique, I use the limiters because it's more that, aggressive. Yeah, that's exactly, yeah, that's it. Have you made a template in Bitwig yet? Yeah. So um, I've got a mixing template. I've got a production template, and I've got a sound design template as well for when I'm making my samples and stuff like that. And I've also got a mastering template. So oh, yeah. you're organised. Yeah. Very. <laughs> oh, wicked, yeah, man. man. Nice. Um, so I think that pretty much wraps it all up. Like normally, what I like to end these um, end these on is just like, you know, asking some like pretty generic questions, but just sort of like get your take on it. So, yeah. you know, for the, for someone who's starting out producing, it's their first year or so, and you know they're they're into this sort of music. Um, you know, what what sort of advice could you give? to someone to sort of 
push them in the right direction without you know without them wasting their time doing a bunch of shit that you might have spent doing when you started out doing did you, yeah. did you get what i mean yeah, yeah yeah so i would say learn learn how to use your tools is number one mm-hmm. learn where, where and when to use them so you don't overuse them mm-hmm. number three is like you know youtube like watch as many tutorials as you can um taking as much information as you can number four i would say simplicity is key less is more as you said and i say mm-hmm. the fifth one the most important one is make sure you're always having fun. That's the most yeah. important. If you're not having fun with it and you're pressurizing yourself and you know, you're trying to do stuff, just remember that everyone's been there. Every single producer would have started with some sort of struggle and how to figure things out, how to learn them, but learn the basics first. Like I know a few people that, and I've, I've done it as well. Like, you know, you go, they go off and they buy loads of equipment and they buy all this shit and they think, yeah, this is going to make, the game change when it just simply mm-hmm. doesn't work that way um, mm-hmm. you know, I've got loads of harder and shit but I could I could achieve an equally as good sound in the box so don't get like daunted by people that have all loads of equipment and stuff you know you can you know it might not sound the, sorry it might not sound the same but you can mm-hmm. get it sounding good enough or as good you know and just don't pressurize yourself yeah. have fun is the most important advice I can give anyone it's music it's not meant to be a chore it's meant to be emotional it's meant to be your soul exactly. kind of form. have fun and don't care what anyone else thinks because if you persist you'll get there and it takes you ages to get there but you will you know like i think scream was saying on his twitter like it takes people 10 years or something to get to some sort of point where you know you're getting a lot of bookings and you're doing all that stuff this is 10 years of persistence mm. you know like how many yeah, man. years are there how many months are there in, the, in 10 years 520 to so say like you spent three hours a day in a studio um, 520 times like you know it's like 10 like 10,000 hours or over that I didn't do the calculation right there all by the way but it's a, a lot of time and they say yeah. that if you spend 10,000 hours on something for a year or you'll two become years, a master you'll be good at it so it's just persistence allow yourself to yeah. fail but don't even see it as failure just see it as I've made something I've learned from it let's move to the next thing and I think yeah that's the yeah, I think the biggest like mistake that people make, or even if they do it like sub- subconsciously, it's seeing it as a race, and it's like, yeah. you know, to, to get somewhere quicker. And it's just it's not it's not the case. Just have fun, enjoy enjoy your time in the door. Because like at the end of the day, if it doesn't work, like you shouldn't be doing it for the end result. You should just be doing it because you want to pick up a skill and make something from scratch that's uniquely yours. You know, that's it, man. Like, you know, you don't. Like some some people like releasing loads, some people don't. If you look at Komodo, like he yeah. doesn't release loads, but when he does release, it's all sh- always tight and great. But then some people like getting yeah. as much exposure as they can. Like find the one that works for you, but always remember that you're only in competition with yourself, no one else, and that's it. And it's sometimes it's a hard pill to swallow, man, because like you might feel you've put in the work and you should be in that position someone else is in. But you know, again, like there's a lot more to it than. Like you said, it's people you know and all that clicky shit, all that stuff, man. But I just try mm. and stay out of it all, to be honest. I just make my tunes and people like them great if they don't. Tell me why you don't like it so I learn something from it and fuck up in it. That's it. That's all you can yeah, do, Yeah, exactly. That's a good place to end it, man. Yeah, that was, <laughs> this whole thing's been sick. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. I'll probably back Re- Really it. insightful, man. Yeah. That, like, mate, listen, like, the people that are watching the channel, they want to hear people babble on especially people you know they've got as much experience as you have and you know you've got the releases under your belt that you've got so you know they're gonna lap this shit up and telling you <laughs> like fully well, let so, me know when it's time and i'll do a little share or whatever yeah definitely man um if you know before we go have you got anything you want to promote any you know anything you're doing um, uh, yes i think the main thing that's happening at the moment is obviously the tune with strategy and footsie which is called Black Boxes. So if you go to YouTube, type Sick in tune. Black Boxes. If you can donate to that cause, that would be great. I think that's that's the main thing I want everyone to focus on. Definitely. Nice man. Yeah, I'm def- I, I'm going to drop a donation on that right after this. Oh, cheers, man. Um, really man. No, nah, definitely. The set, my next century release um, is I think it's come. I mean, I haven't officially announced it. It's coming out. I think August time. Um, okay. Yeah. Some cool tunes that no features or anything. It's just me and my own this time. 
yeah, you'll hear more cool. news about that soon, I'm sure. I think I just got the test presses in the post, so I'll check them out. Decent. Yeah, that'll be the next thing. Uh, also, actually, no, I've got, uh, I'm not sure when, but soon, I've got a remix dropping for Diesel, not Petrol. Um, nice. By Sick Knight, which is coming out on his Darku label, which would be cool. And I've also got someone or two guys that I love very much. They've remixed my tune with Youngster and Rico for my album called Hear That. Nice. So that should be, that'll also be dropping on Century, but I won't say who it is yet. <laughs> but it's fucking nice. It, 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 my, it blew my one out of the water, the bastards. <laughs> what, <isn't it>? Sick, <laughs> man. All right, That's mate. That's nice. Um, yeah, big up for doing this, man. And I really appreciate it. Um, you know, right. you've helped me out a lot with uh, with the door, uh, you know, changing over a spitwig and stuff. And like, yeah, you're done yeah. <laughs> straight up. You think sharply, man. I'm here.